Apologies for any grammar mistakes. English is not my first language. Back in the early 2000s, I was working as a truck driver in Mexico City. I don't recall what I was transporting that evening, but it was late at night and my mind was unfocused and I was cruising a residential street looking for a place to pull over so I could use the bathroom. As I cruised slowly through an intersection without braking, I noticed an individual jaywalking across the street from the glow of my headlights. I pressed down my brakes and honked, shouting in anger out the window at the person. I couldn't tell if the figure was a man or a woman at first, but when they turned around to yell back at me, I was pretty certain that it was a man in woman's clothing. He barked at me for several minutes in a deep, heavy voice and continued off down the sidewalk. In addition to the woman's clothing, I noticed the man was carrying a purse over one shoulder and a bulging plastic bag in his opposite hand. I shrugged and assumed that he was a male prostitute or something of the sort and continued up the road and forgot all about him a few minutes later. The whole incident lasted perhaps 15 seconds. The next day I heard through my wife's brother that an old woman named Anna Maria Alfaro had been murdered in her home the night before. On the exact same block I had encountered the man in woman's clothing. I called the hotline and spoke to a female detective about my exchange with the stranger on the road and she seemed very interested and asked me several additional questions about the person that I hadn't even had time to notice or consider. She then asked me if I would come in and sit down with a sketch artist but I responded that I barely got a good look at the person's face and mostly was just able to describe the person's build and voice. I never heard back from the detective, but what followed for several more years was a reign of murder and terror where several elderly women were murdered in their homes. I remembered I was at my son's birthday party in January of 2006 when I heard the news that the old lady killer had been arrested and while the person I had seen had very likely been the killer, he wasn't a male prostitute. In fact, it wasn't even a he. Juana Barraza was a 50-year-old woman and a professional Mexican wrestler, best known for her bright pink outfit with a butterfly mask. She was detained by police fleeing the scene of her latest murder after neighbors had reported sounds of a struggle. Motivated by the resentment of her mother, who let strange men sexually abuse her as a girl, Barraza murdered more than 11 elderly women in their own homes, often strangling them with phone cords or stethoscopes. After killing them, she would rob their houses and simply walk out the front door and into the night. Barraza had a very masculine face, and due to the testimony of several eyewitnesses, including my own, the police were convinced they were looking for a man dressed as a woman, likely a transvestite and many long months were wasted questioning the transvestite community. Barraza selected the women based on age, location, and how often they were alone. Using a social worker's identification card, she would trick the women into letting her in by saying that she was from the government and informing them they were eligible for welfare programs. In March of 2008, she was sentenced to a whopping 759 years in prison. I often wonder, if I would have been doing the world a favor if I had hit her with my truck that night. I hate the fact that I even have a story to share, but it goes to show you when living in a major metropolitan city, you never know what walks of life you'll pass by or drop off. So a little backstory. In 2003, I was a 16 year old employee at an urban clothing store here on the south side of Chicago. At the time, I had a manager who was in his early 20s by the name of Anthony. Anthony was pretty arrogant and obnoxious, but overall, he was a really cool guy. I used to kind of give him shit and tease him whenever it came to approaching the ladies because he always seemed timid or too aggressive. I was, and still am, a ladies' man. So yeah, I was being an asshole. After working at this place for about three months, Anthony asked me if I would drop him off at home. It wasn't far from the direction I was heading in. So I dropped him off maybe twice a week for the next month or so. Now let me tell you, these car rides were quite uncomfortable. This guy, as much as we spoke at work, would not speak and sort of just kept looking straight, barely ever blinking. It got to the point where his awkwardness went from being entertaining to straight up creepy. Fast forward three or four years later, I'm watching the news as they go into detail of a horrific crime committed by a Comcast installation worker 
Apparently, the worker entered two homes for an installation. He sexually assaulted, beat, and strangled two women. The real unfortunate thing is that this happened on two different occasions. And after the first murder, the gentleman was arrested and questioned, but ended up being released and sent back out to work, which allowed him to strike again. As the picture of his mugshot flashed on the screen, I froze. It was Anthony. Now growing up on the south side of Chicago, I've grown up and befriended a fair share of people who ended up becoming murderers, but this takes the cake. I live in the southern part of California, Orange County to be specific. My dad grew up here before moving in with my mother on the east coast and then eventually back to the OC. When he was a young teenager, most of our neighborhood was full of orange groves. He and his friends used to explore in there and smoke weed in them. My dad told me he once had a friend whose name I can't remember, so for the sake of this story, we'll call him Jack. He was the son of a woman named Frances Marie Klug, a religious cult leader who thought she'd been visited by God or Jesus or something. She claimed to be a prophet and eventually broke away from the Catholic Church to form the Hill of Hope congregation. This woman had a lot of followers. Her son was definitely not one of them, as he would often hang out with my dad in the groves, smoking weed and talking shit about his mother and her followers. Frances, according to my dad, always had these bodyguard type dudes around her, who oftentimes were armed. This made her far scarier than any elderly crazy woman should be. They'd go looking for Jack, forcing him sometimes to hide in the groves. The Hill of Hope eventually created a fort of some kind in Carbon Canyon, fitting because a bunch of creepy as fuck things go on there all the time. At this time, the fort, or compound, was in the process of being built. Jack and his mother had been bumping heads more often, and my dad started to notice that Jack wasn't around as often either. Eventually, he stopped making appearances altogether. Frances Clug eventually up and left with a lover of hers to another country. Some sources say that she returned and eventually died at the hill in 09. But the Hill of Hope is still there in Carbon Canyon. Still guarded and still in use, I believe. They're very secretive, and they don't let any outsiders onto the property. My dad swears that Clug had her followers kill her son and hide his body under the cement foundations of the hill. The kid disappeared without a trace. Clug didn't seem phased, and the cement was laid down shortly afterwards. My dad says it's too much of a coincidence. He never did hear from his friend again. The original poster has included information, an article, and a link to the website of the Hill of Hope. This can all be found in the description below. This encounter took place when I was 13. I live in a very quiet village in Scotland, and this town has never had a kidnapping problem before that I know of, so I wasn't exactly prepared for this encounter. My parents asked me to run to the store for some essentials like milk and bread, etc. So I start walking the half mile or so down to town. Since I am a really paranoid person, I normally keep a good eye out on my surroundings, and I notice something is off. A black minivan is driving slowly behind me, I'm too afraid to turn around to see the driver, but I pick up my walking pace. When I do, they start driving a little faster. In my head, I'm screaming, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. I finally make it to the store parking lot and practically sprint for the front doors. I probably looked like an idiot, but when you think you're going to die, you run pretty fast. I talk to one of the cashiers, who is a very nice young lady who looked to be in her early 20s. I told her I thought I was being followed and pointed to the vehicle so she could get a good look at the plate number. She said that the staff would look out for me. That made me feel a little bit better and I made my way to the dairy aisle. I was scanning for the cheapest milk when there was a tap on my shoulder. 
I turned around to see a six foot two, middle aged man that had greasy black hair and was wearing a tracksuit. Hey there, I just wanted to say that you're really beautiful. Very pretty. He took a few steps towards me. I, being a person who really hates human interaction, started to cry silently. The tears were just spilling down my face with no sound. He takes this opportunity to say, Now, stop crying. I don't want that gorgeous face of yours all wet. You and me should go down and have a drink together. What do you say? I was so scared at this point, but that's when I heard the cashier's voice coming from behind him, asking him what the hell he was doing. Oh, well I'm just asking my beautiful girlfriend if she wants to have a drink at the bar, that's all. I look up to the lady and say, I'm 13. This is where she threatens to call the police. He backs off and says that this has all been a big misunderstanding and he thought I was older. He then turns and runs out of the store. The lady, whose name was Rachel, helped me gather the rest of my items since I was in a panicked state. She then called the police and told them the guy's license plate number and called my parents to inform them that they should come pick me up. I gave her my mom's number. I brought her a box of chocolates the next day to say thank you. I don't know what happened to the man, but I hope he's in police custody where he belongs. I moved to my dad's when I was 10, and I didn't know anyone in the area except for the family my dad was friends with. A single mom with three kids. Luckily, there was a girl a couple of years older than me. I was 12 at the time I met her, and we got to know each other a little over the years. We weren't close, but ended up having the same friends. One night, my friend Rob was hanging out with her and her younger brother. They happened to be in the house alone because my friend's mom was at work. Here's where things get terrifying. Her mom had been helping out this one lady through her work, and she got to know her fairly well. She found out that she had a sister who was in a mental asylum, but had been let out recently. The night Rob was hanging out with my friend, they get a knock on the door. My friend thought it was their mom. She knocks a certain way when coming in, and answered it without thinking. Rob wasn't supposed to be there and took off through the window to his house down the road. He never thought twice about it. It wasn't her mom. It was the sister of the lady her mom was helping. And she figured out through talking to her sister where the family lived and her mom's working schedule. She came in and this is where I don't know all the details and I'm glad I don't. My friend's younger brother got away to the neighbors to call the police. The lady brutally murdered my friend a week from Christmas, decapitated her, and left her body naked in a bathtub. But I don't know for sure. I wasn't allowed to go to her funeral. This happened when I was 9 years old in 1987. I grew up in Townsend, Massachusetts. It's a medium-sized town on the New Hampshire border. My dad worked for a very well-known local plastics company, and my stepmom worked at the Congregational Church. I got dragged along with his wife to church every Sunday, whether I wanted to or not. The one saving grace of going to church with my dad's wife was the opportunity to go on the playground after Sunday school class and the standing offer of cake, which they had almost every Sunday. It was one Sunday in late November, I was dragged to church with my dad's wife. Afterwards, as usual, me and the rest of the kids from class poured into the churchyard to socialize and drop cake everywhere. Now I don't really remember what prompted me to approach a girl named Abby. She was two years younger than me, and a lot more popular. She was somebody that I barely knew, and hardly ever spoke to. But still something within me told me that I had to tell her something important. So I sought her out on the playground that morning. Hey, Abby. I started, feeling driven by something I couldn't explain. You have to grow your fingernails out. So if someone tries to hurt you, you can go right for their eyes. I was dead serious as I said this. She gave me a slightly confused look 
and said, Okay, why? I didn't have an answer to that, so I just kind of shrugged and told her, Just do it, okay? Trust me. A week later, she, her younger brother, and their mom would be found dead, murdered by a neighborhood psychopath named Daniel LaPlante. He had broken into their home, shot and killed Abby's mother Priscilla, and then drowned Abby and her brother William. He managed to hide from the police for at least two days, eventually being captured a half hour away in the town of Ayer. When he was arrested, the police noticed scratches around his eyes. I cried when I found out that she and her family had been brutally murdered. I finally understood why I had to warn her, but still could not explain how I knew. Regardless, I view it as a failure on my part. I remember being incredibly distraught about it. No nine-year-old should have that kind of burden or guilt. I feel awful about what happened to Abby and her family, and I wish I could have done more to save her life. It took me years to mentally accept what happened. Survivor's guilt is a hell of a thing, but I was just too young to fully understand. Hey everyone, it's me, Sammy. I'll be talking about my creepy ex-friend. Her name was Becky. She had something odd about her, but I don't know what it was exactly. She used to talk to herself in our school classes and draw really creepy pictures of her favorite character, the Slender Man. One weekend, she invited my friends Adele and Amelia, including me, for a sleepover. I figured since my best friends are going, it won't be so awkward and agreed. Fast forward to the sleepover, she welcomed us in and led us to the attic. It wasn't the best of places, mold was all over and a little dusty too. We shrugged it off and tried to have fun. Before we knew it, 11pm rolled around. It wasn't as bad as we thought it might be, until Becky decided to go down the attic's wooden steps. Suddenly, the lights went off. It made us feel a little uneasy, but thought we were being pranked or something. However, out of nowhere, Becky starts crawling up the stairs. It creaked with every step and Adele asked her to cut it off. Slowly and eerily, she rushed up to me and leaned up on me, looked me dead in the eyes and tried to put her hands on me. I kicked her off and we bolted out of the house and told our parents about it. The next day at school, Becky was nowhere to be seen. I guess she was changing schools and decided to pull one last odd prank on us. We'll never know. When my mother was 16, she used to take babysitting jobs in the town that she lived in in Massachusetts. She took a job that was an overnighter to watch two young boys. She got to the house around 2 in the afternoon. One of the boys was 5 and the other only 2. The parents said goodbye to their kids. Once the parents left, the children said they wanted to play outside. It was around 4.45 p.m. when they went back inside to watch TV while my mom got dinner ready. Once everything was in the oven, it was around 5.30. She sat down with the boys to watch television until dinner was ready. She noticed something odd. There was a car parked directly across from the house. This wouldn't seem odd to most people, but the house didn't have many neighbors nearby. My mother brushed it off and had the boys come to the table. Once bedtime rolled around, she read them three short stories and put them to sleep. When she returned downstairs, she heard a noise that sounded like a doorknob shaking. My mother doesn't freak out easily. She went by the front door to check things out, but nothing was there. She brushed it off, thinking that she was being paranoid. As she sat on the couch and watched TV, she dozed off but she was awoken a short time later by the sound of someone trying to pick the lock. This is when she became frightened. By the time she got up and checked the door, the noise had stopped. The thought crossed her mind that maybe she was just hearing things. But when she went to go settle back on the couch, she suddenly heard a slamming sound. She looked out the window near the television and saw someone's hand slowly dragging down the window surface. She screamed. 
then ran upstairs to wake up the kids and lock herself in the room with them while she called the police. They ran to her scared because they didn't know what was going on. Before she could get her phone out, she heard a slamming from downstairs as if someone was trying to kick down the front door. She called the cops, but by the time they arrived, the man was gone. My mom finished off the night with the kids while police watched the house. After that night, my mom refused to babysit kids overnight ever again. This happened on Halloween of last year. Me and a couple of buddies were out getting candy. Our neighborhood isn't exactly the safest, but it isn't the worst either. About 90 minutes into trick-or-treating, we see a house with a sign that says go to the van for your candy, which had an arrow pointing down to a creepy looking black van. This house was at the end of the street, so if things did go south, it would be easy to get away fast if necessary. We go to the van, and we see a man sitting in the driver's seat. He tells us, Your candy is in the back here. Open up the door and come on in. I know when something is up, and my alarm bells were punching my brain at this point. We all give each other a confused look. Then we ask the man, Why isn't the door already open? And why aren't you out here? Couldn't you have done the same thing with a take one note or something? He just repeats himself, telling us to get into the back of his van for our candy. We say no and continue on with our trick or treating. About 20 minutes later, we're about two blocks away. We notice a van about halfway down the street behind us, the same black van from before. I tell the others and we agree to haul ass back to my friend's house. Once the van notices us running away, it takes off in the other direction. When we got to our friend's house, we frantically tell our parents about what happened. They called the cops, but as far as I know, they never found the van. We agreed not to trick or treat this year, and decided to just hang out instead. I still wonder what would have happened if we had been stupid enough to enter that van. At this point in the internet, nearly everybody who's been on YouTube knows about PewDiePie. I personally found his videos to be okay, which most people constantly brawl about in the comment section. A few days ago, I decided to check out his channel for you know, any new updates and found some. The average surgery simulator, horror game stuff as usual. I scrolled down until I saw a video I hadn't watched. Which is strange because I remember watching most of the surrounding videos. The video's thumbnail didn't surprise me much. It was just black. I thought it was a little strange, but I didn't care much. I didn't get to see the video's title because nearly instantly after clicking it, it went to full screen. It looked like any other PewDiePie video, with his face on the top right of the screen. At first, thinking it was a mistake on PewDiePie's part, there was no game, just a black screen and PewDiePie's webcam. He narrated it just like any other game, reacting to everything I couldn't see. The video was 10 minutes long, so around 5 minutes in I paused the video and scrolled to the comments to see what was going on. Every comment was basically what you'd see on every other one of his videos, as if he were actually playing the game. I was in the middle of writing a comment. The video unpaused. I, assuming it was me accidentally pressing space, scrolled up to the video to watch. PewDiePie was looking straight towards me. PewDiePie is usually looking left and down, since that's how his camera is angled. So, it was weird to see that he was suddenly right in front of the webcam. He continued to do nothing for the next 30 seconds in which he broke the silence by restating his usual intro lines, hey, going, even Brady. though the video was nearly six minutes in. When he was about to do his famous screech when he said his name, the video was black until about seven minutes in. After the video resumed, I could see a 
terrified looking PewDiePie on the top right. He didn't say anything or do anything. He just looked at whatever he saw, obviously scared beyond belief. This wasn't how PewDiePie normally was when he was afraid. He would usually just screech and laugh it off a few seconds later. I could see that he was genuinely afraid. He started looking around him as if he had just heard something. I could hear a few muffled footsteps in the background of the video, which was probably why PewDiePie looked so paranoid. He got up from his seat and looked around. The video cut off there, but it was only 8 minutes in. After a minute, the video came back on. As far as I could tell, it was being recorded from a poor quality mini camera. PewDiePie was running while holding the camera, so I could basically just see the ground until there was only seconds left in the video. He pointed the camera towards himself, tears in his eyes, and repeated the words, Folat Nig, until the video finally ended. I don't know what happened, or why no one saw what I saw, but I decided to best not bring things up in the comments. Just before I started writing this, I translated Forlat Nig, which is Swedish for Forgive Me. When my mom was 17, she and my grandparents went for a hike in the Belanglo State Forest in Australia. They had a holiday house in Barima, which they would visit quite often on weekends, so going on hikes was common. While hiking along the trail that they had been down numerous times before, they came across a couple of abandoned hiking packs, like those massive ones backpackers have. The packs were stuffed full of clothes and food, but no one else was in sight anywhere, and there wasn't any obvious sign as to why they had been left behind. This was in the early 90s, before cell phones were common, so they couldn't contact a ranger to come and have a look at them. My grandmother immediately became concerned by the strangeness of the situation, and she convinced my grandpa that they should immediately go back to the car, which they did. A few nights later after they returned home to Sydney, my uncle called my grandmother into the living room and pointed at the TV. Some hikers from Germany had been reported missing. They were last seen in the Belanglo forest. My grandmother immediately cried out that her gut feeling had been right even though technically there was no evidence that those bags they found belonged to those exact hikers. Other news reports that came a few years later in 1994 had the entire family in hysterics. The remains of the bodies had been found in the home of Ivan Malat. Malat had massacred numerous victims in the forest and is now known as the Backpack Killer and is one of Australia's most notorious serial killers. It is believed that there are still bodies that have yet to be found. The worst part about it was that the two hiking packs my family found were never linked to any of the bodies. This means that whoever owned them could still be buried in that forest somewhere. The story is told from the point of view of a female. I'm a college student in my second year at university. Overall, it's pretty nice. Freedom is pretty cool, if you call having a curfew and strict dorm regulations freedom. Anyways, my grades are decent, and there is a few attractive guys in my class. However, currently, I'm sort of stuck, as my entire campus is on lockdown. The text to alert students of the lockdown came around 8 o'clock this morning, and we haven't heard a word since. I room with two other girls a hyper redhead named Allie, and a girl from Africa named Samantha. Both of them are nice enough, and we all get along well. At first, the three of us just assumed it was a drill. They have those occasionally. That they just wanted to ensure that everything was okay, and that the emergency alarm system was working properly, and that students know how to respond. However, those tend to stop pretty quickly. It's been hours. Not to mention the yelling we heard at the beginning, though it could have just been the initial panic. It ended up stopping about an hour into the lockdown, though it did scare the daylights out of Samantha. 
Before anyone questions our safety precautions, we have the blinds down and the doors locked. There's a very small wooden chair shoved under the handle, though I doubt that would do much. Sam and Ellie attempted to push the dresser from the bedroom to the door. According to protocol, we're supposed to barricade all possible exits. But the doorway is so small that we can't fit the damn thing in there. Figures that the college board being a bunch of cheapskates will cost us our lives. I always joke about it, them being so cheap, but I didn't really think it would actually become a problem in the future. I know I may be overreacting, but are lockdowns really supposed to last this long? Internet and cell service keeps cutting in and out. It's so hard to contact the people in the other dorms. Though Samantha managed to get a hold of her mom briefly, she wasn't aware of the lockdown. She said there wasn't anything on the news. I guess that rules out school shooter, because reporters always end up on site as it's happening. I figured posting this here would at least give me something to focus on. Allie and Sam are talking about checking out around the hallways. Maybe we can find some students who actually know what's going on. My college is a pretty decent size, so it shouldn't be that hard to find someone. I figure if we don't hear anything in the next couple of hours, we should look around. It may have just been a false alarm. Either way, I'll be sure to make an update as soon as I know what's going on. Last night at around 9, Samantha decided that she had enough. Allie and I chickened out, so we stayed here. Sam said that she would be right back. She was going to try to find someone and figure out what's going on, but she hasn't come back. Neither Allie nor I have heard anything. It looks like there are a few posts on social media from other confused students, but all of them are in the same situation we are. There was a brief talk about meeting up, but if Sam didn't come back, I don't know what to think about that. We've also tried to call the police, but they keep hanging up on us. I really don't know what to do. It's been a hectic week. Last time I updated this, Samantha had just left, and it was mostly quiet. After I attempted to call the police, Allie and I spent most of the night studying. Exams are important, and it gave us something to do while we waited. I guess I passed out sometime the night before, because I woke up to the sound of police sirens outside. There was blood. Everywhere. I mean everywhere. On the floor, the walls, and even on the ceiling of the hallways. Over a fourth of our student population is missing. And that isn't counting the bodies that they did manage to find. They were torn apart by something. After the police escorted the remaining students out of their dorms, most of them just went home. My school isn't a very large one, so we all lost at least one person. No one knows where the missing are. The officer said that they try to keep situations like this out of the public eye. God only knows what that means. If your college starts giving an alarm, don't brush it off. Barricade yourself immediately. And if someone knows what happened to Samantha, please tell me.